on this Monday night, an Ontario group home operator under scrutiny. There's nothing you can do legally to stop them. So what are you supposed to do? The kids and teens desperate to escape a dangerous situation. Global News investigates. The advice the head of Canada's spy agency gave the Prime Minister about invoking the Emergencies Act. It was indeed required. You remember saying that? Yes. New revelations at the inquiry. Mixing politics with sports. The goal to stand up for human rights at the World Cup. And moon milestone. You are seeing the Earth. You are seeing home. Another success for NASA's Artemis mission. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. For more than a year, our investigative team has been uncovering harrowing details about Ontario's child welfare system. Tonight, an examination into a for-profit company that runs group homes and foster homes for kids who have been abused, orphaned, or have behavioral issues. Homes where kids were so desperate to escape, they risk falling into a world of drugs and sex trafficking. Carolyn Jarvis has our top story tonight and a warning some of the images in it may be disturbing. What you're hearing are the cries of an 11-year-old girl being physically restrained by group home workers. Stand up. We're so Stand up. In the next room, Cassidy Frank would listen to this sometimes for hours. They'd restrain her everywhere, on the bed, on the floor, against the wall. Cassidy was one of four girls who in 2021 lived together in this group home, a place for kids who've been abused, orphaned, or have behavioral issues. The home is run by a for-profit company called Hats Off, one of the largest operators of group homes in Ontario. Here, Cassidy says, her trauma only deepened. It was scary, really, really scary. Which is why when a worker at the home named Shadia Youssef offered to be a mother figure to Cassidy and take her home, she saw a way out. Hi, I'm Cassidy's new mother. So nobody verified where you were going? No. Yusuf took her to her apartment and on the first day, Cassidy says, forced her to sell drugs. She's like, get out of the car and go sell it. Incredibly, the worker who was supposed to protect her overdosed, Cassidy says, and police took her to hospital. Meanwhile, Cassidy was left alone in the apartment for two weeks as strange men came to check on her, she says, warning she was at risk of being trafficked. I was freaking out. I was like, okay, like, what do I do? Yusuf denies any connection to drugs or human trafficking and says she left because she had a breakdown. The vulnerable youth in group homes should be nowhere near drugs or human trafficking, but they are often dangerously interwoven. Group homes and residential treatment centers are magnets for exploiters. Former Hats Off workers, whose identities we've concealed for fear of reprisal, say girls as young as 12 would leave in the middle of the night. When they would come back, they would report it was with these strangers. They made me do weird things, like consume illicit substances. They would engage in sexual acts. A lot of youth would disclose, I was just so desperate to get out of here. In Hats Off group homes, workers say there was no money for outings. And ministry inspections show for a time, one home relied on a food donation from a church. Uh, Look at it crawl. Workers documented bed bugs, an infestation in a basement, rats, and severe disrepair. Dismal living conditions that Hats Off says have been resolved. It also disputes the rat complaint and a lack of money for kids. You want things, right? Hats Off doesn't buy you anything. The pimp will give them the love that they want and every other thing they want. But what makes Hats Off stand out is just how many kids ran away. In four years, Hats Off reported kids going AWOL, as they call it, 1,170 times. Among the highest per bed of any group home operator in the province. There's nothing you can do legally to stop them. So what are you supposed to do? Hats off, which declined an interview, said missing kid reports are filed for many reasons, including being late for curfew. Though it acknowledged human trafficking victims often played a role. It has undertaken a massive effort to train staff, it said, and developed safety plans. It also said restraints are used as a last intervention when the safety of a child is at immediate risk. As for Cassidy, a knock on the apartment door was her salvation. 
undercover officers with the human trafficking unit slipped her a fake business card with their number on it. When she was alone, she made the call, and police officers drove her seven hours north to be reunited with her mother. Shadia Youssef was never charged. The group home Cassidy fled was closed shortly after she left, though Hats Off still operates nine others. What does the government need to know about Hats Off? Shut it down. After our deadline, we received an email with 40 letters of endorsement from Hats Off workers at the request of their CEO. While approximately half of them were anonymous, they described a family-like environment where staff go the extra mile, money isn't an issue, and the homes are well cared for. Certainly a dramatically different perspective from the roughly 70 people we spoke with for our investigation. Donna? All right, Carolyn Jarvis, thanks. And the investigation continues tomorrow. Allegations of over-medicating kids at Hats Off group homes and what the Ontario government has to say about our findings. Now to some revealing testimony at the inquiry into the use of the Federal Emergencies Act last February. The head of CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, says he advised the Prime Minister to invoke the act in order to end the protests that occupied the streets near Parliament Hill for weeks. At issue in these hearings is whether invoking the act was warranted. The head of CSIS said even though the protests didn't meet the legal definition of a national security threat according to the rules of his organization, he did think invoking the Emergencies Act was necessary. Mike Armstrong explains. Good morning. And This was the third time the top officials with Canada's spy agency have spoken to the commission, but the first time publicly. The other hearings were behind closed doors to keep classified information secret. We're not investigating the convoy itself. The head of CSIS was careful to lay out why the spy agency was involved in something that wasn't related to espionage or foreign interference. Public protest is protected, he said, but there were individuals taking part who CSIS was already watching. The spy agency kept an eye on them and the possibility they could spread violent extremism. So it was essentially a twofold analysis, making sure we understood what our subject and the investigations were, were doing, uh, associating with and so on, but also understanding who were others who could potentially radicalize. Now, under CSIS's mandate, the head of the spy agency said the so-called Freedom Convoy never fit its definition of a threat to the security of Canada. David Vigneault was part of cabinet meetings where use of the Emergency Act was debated. He told the commission Monday that in those meetings, he told the Prime Minister the act should be invoked, that its definition of a threat was different from that of CSIS. That opinion was provided, if you want, as a uh, national security advisor, as opposed to a, uh, the director of CSIS specifically. 10, 13 a.m. Now, there was some friction between the CSIS panel and the lawyer for the protesters. He was trying to argue the people with Confederate and Nazi flags were plants to make the protesters look bad, even going so far as naming an employee at a public relations firm. So counsel, I have not, I have not testified to that, counsel. Yeah, you haven't testified to it, but you know that to be true, don't you? No, that's not fair, firstly. In a statement, a the company statement. calls the accusation absurd and despicable and says it's reviewing legal options. The police services have... A also on the stand Monday, emergency preparedness minister Bill Blair. He is the first of seven cabinet ministers expected to take the stand this week. Justin Trudeau is scheduled to appear Friday. Donna? All right, Mike Armstrong in Ottawa, thanks. In Colorado, there is heartbreak and outrage after the shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub Saturday night. Five people were killed, at least 20 others injured, and it could have been worse. Some of the patrons are being hailed as heroes for stopping the gunman. The 22-year-old suspect faces five counts of first-degree murder and bias-motivated crime causing injury. His background is still being investigated, but police say he has a history of violence. Jennifer Johnson reports. As a makeshift memorial grows outside Colorado Springs Club Q, a community in mourning wants answers. Why the shooter picked that nightclub, known as a safe haven for the city's LGBTQ community? And should Colorado's red flag law been triggered to potentially stop the shooter from getting firearms? It's still too early, and I, and I hate to say that because people want information at this stage. Uh, you know, the, the people, people deserve to know what happened here. Many are wondering how accused shooter, 22-year-old Anderson Lee Aldrich, got the AR-15-style semi-automatic weapon used in the shootings. Blow it to holy hell. After videos obtained by the Associated Press show a standoff Aldrich had with police in 2021. 
live streaming himself on Facebook as he threatened to blow up his mother's home. Family members who lost loved ones in Saturday night's deadly shooting are in shock. It's just a nightmare that you can't wake up from. I keep thinking it's so, you know, it's just, it's a mistake. They've made a mistake and, and that he's really alive. Officials are investigating whether this was a hate crime. Officials say Aldrich immediately opened fire after entering the club, but instead of running for their lives, two patrons struggled with the shooter, hit him with his own gun, and tackled him to the ground. I don't know who stopped him, but I'm grateful because they most certainly saved my life. Police say those patrons likely saved many lives. The nightclub massacre has sparked vigils in cities across the country and more fear among the LGBTQ community. There's always going to be people that just hate that I exist for no real reason. Last year, anti-gay crimes in the U.S. surged by more than 50 percent. Now this community is its latest victim, trying to heal from this horrific mass shooting. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. The union representing hundreds of Loblaw workers in Calgary says more than 534 members have been given layoff notices. The union says that amounts to 99 percent of workers at the Loblaw Distribution Centre. Contract negotiations are underway. Workers are asking for a wage increase. The union says it's prepared to restart talks to avoid further layoffs. Global News reached out to Loblaw for comment. Last week, the company reported a 30 percent increase in its third quarter profits compared to last year. Warnings to stop it now or else. Coming up, renewed fears of Europe's largest nuclear power plant being in the crosshairs of Russia's war in Ukraine. Rescuers in Indonesia are working to save people trapped after a powerful earthquake hit the main island of Java. At least 162 people are known to have died. Hundreds more are injured and overwhelmed hospitals are treating them outside on stretchers and blankets. The magnitude 5.6 quake struck the greater Jakarta area in the late afternoon. Indonesian officials say more than 13,000 people were displaced by the disaster, which damaged thousands of homes. Indonesia is on the Pacific Ring of Fire the most seismically active zone in the world. The number of dead is expected to rise as rescue teams reach rural areas. Winter is coming fast in Ukraine, and now people who are already suffering because of Russia's attacks are having to leave their homes. Authorities have begun evacuations from recently liberated regions because there's no heat, power, or water. The World Health Organization warns millions are facing a life-threatening winter. The devastating energy crisis the deepening mental health emergency, constraints on humanitarian access and the risk of viral infections will make this winter a formidable test for the Ukraine health system and the Ukraine people. There are also stark warnings tonight about a potential nuclear disaster at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gamansing reports. Images of the damage have not been shared, but the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has monitors inside the Ukrainian nuclear plant, says a radioactive waste and storage building, cooling pond sprinkler system, and a cable for one of the diesel backup generators have all been affected. Until we have this plant protected, the possibility of a nuclear catastrophe is there. Rafael Grossi, the director general of the IAEA, told 60 Minutes the Zaporizhia power plant's position on the front lines of the war creates an unprecedented situation for the world. Grossi has met personally with the presidents of both Russia and Ukraine, imploring both men to create a buffer zone around the facility. The plant is occupied by Russian forces. Strikes this past weekend, according to a statement put out by the watchdog agency, came within meters of key safety and security systems. If you protect it, there's no dirty bomb. While the world has so far avoided a nuclear disaster, shelling around Zeprizia region has resulted in heaps of pain. With my own eyes, I saw glass flying, shrapnel flying, drawers falling on me. Seconds later, there was a fire. The gas line erupted. Ihor Skravets says he was barefoot walking through the debris to rescue his mother-in-law. All of this on a day of reflection in Ukraine. November 21st marks the Maidan uprising. 
The deadly three-month-long civil war started in 2013 when the government unexpectedly ditched a European Union agreement, opting to strengthen ties with Russia. The people eventually secured new elections, constitutional reforms, and got that EU association, lighting the fuse on the powder keg between the Kremlin and Ukraine. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Relations between two Balkan neighbors, Kosovo and Serbia, are deteriorating rapidly, and a dispute over vehicle license plates is prompting warnings of a possible return to the region's violent past. The European Union's top diplomat spent eight hours today urging leaders of Serbia and Kosovo to de-escalate. He says both parties showed unconstructive behavior. The flashpoint is a demand 10,000 Kosovan Serbs replace their Serbian license plates with ones from Kosovo or face stiff fines. In response, more than 600 Kosovan Serb police officers resigned. About 13,000 people died in the war for Kosovo's independence, which began in 1998. Serbia launched a brutal crackdown to curb a separatist rebellion by ethnic Albanians. NATO bombed Serbia in 1999 to end the war, and Kosovo declared independence, but Serbia doesn't recognize it. Qatar controversy ahead. What is overshadowing the soccer matches? The World Cup is supposed to be all about soccer, but in Qatar, it was always going to be more complicated. From allegations of corruption to the fact homosexuality is illegal there, there's a great deal overshadowing the matches. Canada's first game is on Wednesday. Today, International Development Minister Harjit Sajjan met Canada's team, part of a diplomatic visit to Qatar. Some human rights campaigners are disappointed the Canadian government didn't boycott the tournament like it did the Beijing Olympics. Redmond Shannon reports on how politics and soccer are clashing at this World Cup. Ticket chaos. The app stopped working. We cannot see our tickets. And there's this line, so we don't know what's going on. Not what you'd expect from an event estimated to have cost more than $100 billion. Many fans missed the start of the England-Iran game, including its political dance. England's captain Harry Kane wanted to wear this rainbow armband in support of LGBTQ2 plus rights in Qatar. It came after FIFA's president bizarrely said on Saturday, Today I feel uh, gay. On Monday, FIFA threatened Kane and six other European captains with yellow cards unless they wore these FIFA armbands instead. So the teams backed down. It's a shame that it's, it's, it's not happening because it's uh, it's just a fight against discrimination all around the world. But England's players did take a knee to highlight inequality. And Iran's team refused to sing their anthem, a gesture apparently in support of women's rights protesters back home. Canada's Minister for International Development, Harjit Sajjan, is in Qatar. He met with some of the Canadian team before he watches the long-awaited opener Wednesday. Human rights campaigners want Team Canada to follow the lead of other nations and take a stand in support of migrant workers' rights and other oppressed groups in Qatar. Well, I hope that the Canadian uh, delegation, the official delegation, will use uh, this opportunity to highlight to the team that this is a Canadian priority. Canada soccer is not saying whether anything is planned. Sajan meets Qatar's Deputy Prime Minister Tuesday. Sajan's spokesperson told Global News that Canada will continue to engage Qatar bilaterally on key Canadian priorities, including human rights. I don't anticipate that there's any real authenticity to the message that they're going to give around legislative reforms. Some LGBTQ2 plus advocates think Canada's government should have boycotted Qatar altogether, like it did with this year's Beijing Winter Games. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Going dark, NASA's spacecraft zips around the far side of the moon. We are now less than two minutes away from our anticipated loss of signal as Orion travels behind the moon. Orion is doing its thing, leaving NASA in the dark for 34 minutes as it whipped around the far side of the moon. At one point, it was about 130 kilometers from the surface of the moon. This test flight is unmanned, but as Eric Sorensen reports, if all goes well, it is the first step in a new era of lunar exploration. 
As the Orion spacecraft pulled away from Earth five days ago, it set its sights on the moon. Now, 370,000 kilometers away, the images evoke a sense of wonder, even from NASA officials looking back home. Now you are seeing the Earth, you are seeing home, you are seeing yourself in that image right there. As Orion disappeared behind the far side of the moon, in this animation flying just over 100 kilometers above the surface, Mission Control lost contact, as expected, for an anxious 30 minutes. And then, relief, as our planet re-emerged, the Artemis mission still on course. Our pale blue dot and its 8 billion human inhabitants now coming into view. It's been 50 years since NASA sent a spacecraft with astronauts to the moon and back. There is additional caution now. This flight is carrying test dummies, moonikins, part of a rigorous testing that will see the spacecraft swing into a much more distant orbit before making its return. We're going to be going 40,000 miles past the moon, getting into deep space, analyzing all the uh, data from the anthropometric dummies on board, looking at the radiation environment, making sure that it performs as it should before we put crew on board the uh, Orion spacecraft. That crew is scheduled to be on board in just two years and will include one of four active Canadian astronauts. In a few months, we should hear which Canadian that will be. There will be announcements following uh, concerning the crew that will be on board the uh, Artemis II, among which uh, Canadian Space Agency astronaut. In as little as three years, astronauts are expected to return to the surface of the moon. That will begin a new era, not just to visit the moon and ultimately Mars, but to establish a lunar base where humans will learn to work and to live in another world. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that's Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's here Canada is snowy Calgary, Alberta. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.